and my my VHS. Loving the t-shirt, by the way. <laughs> you can wear that again. Hello, hello. Welcome back, everybody. My name is Phil Marriott. Thank you very much for coming back. If you have been um, somebody who's watched some of the previous videos. Uh, Today, Boys on Film, another film review. And I'm delighted to welcome my very good friend, Paul Joseph, for another film review of a horror film called Shepherd. How are you, Paul? Hello. Hi, I'm good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, good. So, Shepherd, a British horror film uh, Mm -hmm. from writer-director Russell Owen. The film starts with uh, a young man who's clearly in a bit of a bad way. He's having a flash back to being at a funeral he wakes up he's, he's on his own in a messy apartment and clearly life's not treating very well he opens newspaper and decides to take up a job as a shepherd in a very rural place in I think the Outer Hebrides which involves staying in a dilapidated cottage next to a lighthouse whatever's happened in his life and the demons that he has inside appear to follow him mm, indeed very well summed up it's Tom Hughes who was in TV's Victoria uh, who plays the lead role. He plays the Scottish Shepherd. Um, Kate Dickey is in it as well. I love Kate Dickey. Have you seen her in love, Red Road? Love Kate Dickey. Amazing yeah. in Red, Red Road. Amazing in The Witch. Yeah. Uh, and of course, um, Game of Thrones. She's one of those people who will immediately lend gravitas to a, a, um, a, a project. She's considerably more Scottish than he is in the film. He didn't really seem to have an accent, although to be no. fair, he didn't doesn't really talk very much. A lot, a lot of the film, he's kind of on his own with his dog and, and some sheep. Yeah, kind of experiencing. Baxter. Kate Dickey plays the uh, half-sighted boat woman, who apparently was originally meant to be a man, but I think okay. the writer-director thought it was a bit too too parody because it, it yeah. seemed a bit like um, what's the what's the guy in the adverts for Fish Fingers? Captain Birdseye. Captain Birdseye, yeah, kind of that's him. Salty old sea dog. <laughs> yeah. Greta Skaki. Now, I don't know how you pronounce her name. Is it Skaki, Skatchy? I, I've I always said Skaki. I think I'd say Scarchy. Scarchy. She's Scarchy. Italian, right? Yeah. But she's been in a lot of things in the Unrecognisable. I did not know it was her until I saw the credits roll at the end. Yeah, and I think that was deliberate because I think she wanted to play a very yeah. unglamorous looking woman. We know that she's been in a lot of glamorous roles, like back yeah. in the 80s and 90s. I remember seeing her in in a, a film called The Ebony Towers, a TV adaptation or TV movie with uh, Sir Laurence Olivier and Toy Wilcox. And it was set in France Ooh. and she looked very glamorous. She played the mouse. Yeah, in, in yeah. No, she you associate her with that glamour. And when I say that she's unrecognisable, I should say that for a horror film, it's not like she's dressed as a monster or got loads of prosthetics. She's just very, very... Um, she, she plays a very plain, sort of downtrodden... Widow. Wid- widow wid- yeah, on, on widow a farm, man. yeah. Yeah, set in the windy Scottish Highlands, like you say. Mm. Um, like I said, I'm not sure when it was meant to be set. Because it did have that kind of timeless feel about it. I don't know whether it was yeah. current or old. It felt very old to me. And even and even there's a there's a sort of flashback that involves a car. But even then, that is um, like it's like an old mini, isn't it? Which could be someone now who has an old car, or it could be an old car back in the day. I mean, we can say this because it's in the synopsis, yeah. isn't it? He's he's yeah. grieving. They, there was an accident involving yeah. him and his wife and she was yeah. pregnant. Some of it is dreams, nightmares, some of it is what you mm. would expect to be reality, but is it? And all throughout the whole film, I'm just thinking, is this meant to be real? And because he does dream a lot and you see him waking up from scenes. Yeah, and some quite quite extended dream sequences as well, which I'm always a bit ambivalent about dream sequences in horror films because I find sometimes it's a bit of a bit of a cheek. It's almost like you get out. the horror and the scares. And I think I think there's you know this kind of film is the one where there's there's a few different levels it can work on. Obviously, it's someone who has gone through a very difficult experience. If you think I keep bringing these films up, if you think of recent films like Midsummer at the beginning, something horrific happens to that character. So then when she goes into the the setting for the main plot, she's already in a bit of a bad way. So this is similar to that. And of course, he's then going to an isolated place. It's very strange to him, and there's lots of strange things. So it's it's that thing about how much is his environment that's that's difficult and troubling and perhaps dangerous. How much is it is he interpreting? And then is a, another level of is there something more supernatural or malevolent? As the film concludes, that stuff gets a bit jumbled up, and I think it perhaps tries to have its cake and eat it. You end up kind of saying, well, actually, what plane is this working on? Is it reality? Is it 
is it his mind is it a purgatory is it that kind of thing and i don't know whether it answers that satisfactorily and i'm saying that knowing that sometimes ambiguity is entertaining in itself and that that leaves a bit of mystery but i kind of think some of it's a bit squandered by the end yeah i have to say i would agree with you because throughout the whole film i i felt a little bit frustrated by it because i didn't know which direction it was going it did seem Mm. to be trying to go in so many different directions and i like that you know like you say i like the mystery of it i like the ambiguity of it because it Mm. it keeps you guessing but ultimately i did become a bit tired of it and I I thought particularly between well between halfway and the final act I thought it did drag a bit because it's about an hour and 40 minutes I think they probably could have trimmed it by 15 because there's a scene where he goes to look for his dog and And, yeah and I just I just just think it's that that bit of that little bit of plotting towards the end where I don't know whether it's as tight as it should be. And again, you know, maybe on a second watch, some of it might make a a little bit more sense. I mean, you can see that obviously the grief is playing tricks on his mind as well with things that happen at the beginning because he he obviously wants to get away for isolation because he's struggling mentally with having to deal with this, you know, horrific thing that's happened in his life. Yeah. Uh, And he does go and see his mum, his mum Greta Skacky, Skatchy. How, what are we going with? Skatchy. (laughs) What's the, the gallery? Sarchy. Sarchy. Maybe it's Skatchy. I've always said Skacky, but I don't know. I I probably, I'm probably too familiar with that now to change it. If you're watching Greta, if you're watching Greta, let us know. (laughs) Yeah. Write it phonetically in the comments, please. (laughs) She's not very welcoming when he goes to visit her because there's a lot of baggage. There's a lot of history um, because she didn't get on with his, his wife, girlfriend, wife, wife. Yeah. She called her a bit of a whore and uh, yeah, she yeah. she said she was playing and around with other men. There's a little bit of a sense of a sort of prodigal son thing perhaps about him that he went off led by this relationship that then ended up tragically and has come back and she doesn't approve. So it kind of I guess it, it's a point where that character is maybe seeking a certain sanctuary but then is still further isolated. I mean the setting but, is great cuz he goes to this Yeah, and I, I think island. I think perhaps because we've led with talking about the story it's led me to going on to some of the stuff that I didn't feel was so good towards the end of the film but I kind of think in in the film's favour, it is incredibly atmospheric. Um, you, you sent me a message saying, you know, wrap up in a in a sweater and have a cup of tea because you're gonna yeah. be you're gonna feel windswept yeah. by it's this. It's really, yeah. I mean, the location the location work is amazing. I mean, they've totally they have really nailed it, and it the place looks incredible, and it's so isolated, and the sound design of the wind, and also the wind and how it would rattle through this old dilapidated building and all that sort of stuff. It's kind of, it, it's really good. And of course that all that all adds to his discomfort and what are these sounds and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, on that level of someone being in a kind of foreboding place that's really unwelcoming and being really isolated, that does work really well. And it's probably a bit unfair, but I often associate um, British horror with being relatively low budget. And I wouldn't say this is necessarily mega bucks, but there's a, let's say, a, a, a ship shaped prop that appears oh, yeah. <laughs> halfway through. Yeah. And you're like, wow. I think there's a really effective use of CGI. And like you say, it might not necessarily be a you know, big budget movie, but it didn't feel like a cheap film. And I think no, they no. they knew how to, how to make it look atmospheric as well. And there was a yeah. nice kind of blue gray tint to the to the picture as well and And like you say the set design set design was great I thought because I mean you could tell that there were scenes that were filmed in a studio but it did make good use of that it did feel like it was kind of similar to similar to the outside shots and there were you know there was like a scene where he's out looking for his dog and um the sort of the, the sort of mist sets upon him the fog rolls in kind of all around him and envelops him and that was you know and I would imagine that would have been maybe some live effects, but then a lot of CGI as well, but it, it does look really good. He's going out to see these sheeps and there's a great moment where he's sort of like, I think he's like rebuilding a wall or something. Every time he goes there, this wall seems to have um, fallen down again. And he just turns around and there's sort of like, about 80 sheep just staring at him. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> that's what I loved about it as well because we saw that in The Witch and we saw that in Lamb more recently yeah. where it's almost like nature is trying to tell him something. It's trying to yeah. warn him. It's like yeah. all these sheep for, for starters and the dog, you know, he gives off signs that he's not happy about where he is. 
and and I love that because you know the the noises of the wind and and other things that are happening. It it's almost like nature is is saying something bad is about to happen. You've got that ominous feel. Yeah. But I was going to give a name check to the guy who did the sound design and the score, Callum Donaldson. I think he did a really good job on this because it did feel. Yeah. I was listening in my headphones. I had my wireless headphones oh. and it, it felt it it did make a big difference. I think to actually watching yeah, it just not, it's, normally it's, from TV. It's really good. Like you know and and so. so sort of thing that some films don't necessarily pay the right attention to that kind of thing and I think when you're trying to create that atmosphere the sound is so so important and you really did get how things felt around him kind of physically and that that was really good and you had the clocks ticking you know the ominous zoom ins of of objects (laughs) as well as like slow slow camera that's fading into something Um, yeah I I thought it felt really atmospheric and I love the ghostly feel of it. I love how Kate Dickey's character as well had the the dirty fingers you know there were close ups of her handing over, I can't remember what it was, she was handing over a key or something and uh, And or maybe it was the journal, she was giving him a journal because she wanted him to write his experiences every day and there's reason for that obviously we see in the outcome Um, but yeah she felt very very ghostly I I thought it was well done I, I kind of wanted I wanted it to be a little bit pacey. I mean, I'm all for a slow burn. I love a, sl- a slow burn in yeah. horror films and ghost stories, but for me, I did become a little bit frustrated because of, I think because it was such a long film, it felt like a long film, an hour and 40 to me, I think they could have snipped it a bit. But I, I enjoyed it as well, and I do think it, you know, I think if you're, if it's on one level, you can interpret it as it's almost like this, this job that he does as a shepherd in this place he goes to is almost like a, a place where people who've done certain things have to go and almost do this kind of this task who's the is it a promethean task oh, that yeah, you know you're yeah. never going to finish we never really knew much about his character about eric black but there was mm. backstory that became more kind of familiar towards the end and i think that was a little bit too late i kind of wanted more at the beginning because i didn't feel like he I didn't really knew him that much to invest in his character because he no. was quite quiet. He didn't really say much. He was talking yeah. more to the dog because obviously he was just alone with the dog. <laughs> well, it was just them two. And he kind of seemed to spend a lot of time sort of just staring into the middle distance anyway. Yeah. When he was like talking to people, he'd be kind of not I'm like me now. I'm just kind of like not really, he's almost like sort of looking through them. And, I never I really mean, felt like I knew him. No, no. And I guess there is that, there is that enigmatic thing about him but yeah it's almost like if we'd known a little bit more I suppose it's hard isn't it because if you've got a character who's on their own unless they're going to be kind of soliloquizing and talking out loud or having really big conversations with a dog how are you going to get some of that stuff across and of course there are various flashbacks but you know as I said earlier you need to be a bit careful with the use of flashback star rating over to you Paul it's a three from me yeah me too yeah yeah I I wanted to love it more because I I love the feel of it and yeah. I thought the performances were good. For, for, all, for all the frustrations I had with some of the how, how it unfolded, the overall it is, it does, you know, it's a very effective thing to watch and it does really kind of lure, lure you in if you can kind of get the opportunity to sort of turn the lights off, put your jumper on and focus on it. Yeah, definitely. And I think it will please horror fans that love that kind of ghostly feel. Props to the, the, the lead actor for the scene where he literally swims out fully clothed in the sea in the outer Hebrides or whatever yeah. it is it's kind of um, I mean I think it was filmed partly in, in Scotland and Wales wasn't it I think I don't, yeah. I don't know where different locations were but um, yeah because yeah, I think the writer director like, is Welsh isn't he but it's called Shepherd it's available on Blu-ray and digital download from 21st of February check the links down below uh, for all the info that you need if you want to watch it if you want to buy it and yeah thank you Paul for your uh, always excellent advice and opinions on on films particularly horror You're films um, thanks for having me for my my VHS loving the t-shirt by the way <laughs> <laughs> you can wear that again I will <laughs> thanks for watching everyone see you next time bye